Hello, and welcome to the Art of Intuition podcast. My name is Susan Jane, and I believe that trusting your intuition is the best way to live your life with meaning and purpose. Each week you will hear about how you can connect, develop, and trust your intuition through interviews with other guests and my own personal experiences. Join me to understand how your intuition can guide you towards a life full of meaning and loving purpose. Hello and welcome to the Voice of Intuition podcast. I'm Susan Jane, your host for the podcast, and today we have got the lovely Sophia on. Now, wait until you hear what she has to say. She she goes into talking about spirit and following our intuition, she, and, and she does it in a different format to how I do it. So you're really going to enjoy this. It, the, the, way, the way different coaches and different people speak about it, it allows you to connect with various people you know like you don't have to take on board everything I say you don't have to take on board everything anyone else says all our guests say but you take on snippets of everything in it and it allows you to become who you are so you're going to really enjoy Sophia's today but first of all like subscribe um, share the podcast so we can get it out there to everyone and um, there was something else I was going to say and I can't remember what it was so Let's let's just keep going. Um, so welcome on board, Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Hello. It will come back to you before the end of the show. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I because I, I we've had a little bit of a chat before we started, and just the way you explain things, you explain it in a way that it, it, it's really lovely. It's it's done differently, and and that's what I like about having these guests like yourself on the show is because you can put things across and we might all be talking about the same things but you're putting it across in a manner that will resonate with other people but today we're really we're really focusing on that area where I know I was in this and I'm pretty sure you were in it the way you yeah well, definitely you were in it because that's why we're talking about it <laughs> when you're in this you're in this uh life where you're working, you're looking after children, um, mainly mainly focusing on women here, but you're in this like drudgery. And you yeah, know the, there's the something busyness more. of life, yes. Yes. And you know there's something more and you want to how do we how do we sort of move into that? So that's what we're going to talk about today. But let's have a little bit more about your background. Um, how did you get to where you are? Oh, it was not an easy journey, I will tell you right now, Um, because where I started was extremely rational minded, two plus two equals four, scientific, everything has cause and effect and meaning that can be measured and described in this physical 3D world. And so there was no space for the exception to natural law, this sort of thing. Miracles were not a thing in my mindset at that time. And so I, I was in corporate America. I ran international data centers in, for a Fortune 100 bank. Okay, um, and really into this performance-based kind of life, and it's all measurable and accountable. And you set your smart goals, and you go make things happen. <laughs> mm, oh, yeah. So and that, is- so that's where I started at, and then. When your soul wants to get your attention, it will start to take things away from you uh, that are distracting you. And oh, wow. So what, what happened to you? What, did, what was it taking away? And when you say that, what do you mean by take away? Okay. Um, I'm a very stubborn kind of person. I was raised by a German and a Norwegian, so very rigid mindset around... Uh, work and what is success and this sort of thing. And so I had highly developed my mind. I'd learned all of these management skills. And that was the important stuff to me, being skilled in the workplace and having the, the signs of success around me, right? I've got the husband and we've got two cars and the house and the 
you know, the yard, picket fence and the whole business, right? Investment properties. We went on beautiful trips, this kind of stuff. That's what I was focused on. And over the course of a couple of years, my soul had been trying to get my attention to have me step into the world of there is more than just the 3D body. And I kept ignoring it. So, okay, hang on, hang on. Yeah. How was it trying to get your attention? This is so interesting. How yes. is it doing? Yeah. How is yes. It doing? So, the, the first few things are little tiny, small whisper kind of things. I, I ran into a book by Candace Pert that talked about molecules of emotion. She's a neuroscientist who has now passed on. Um, but she discovered a lot of the chemical messengers that correspond with different emotional states that we have. And she she actually in her work takes it even a step farther and kind of begins to tie that into like the higher self and the messages that are coming from your higher self. And so I, I ran into her work. I ran into, um, oh, what do they call it? Uh, Psy K. It was my first uh, step into like muscle testing for absolute truth. And so I kind of brushed up against that, but I didn't really take the bait and delve deeper. And so those were some of the early things that my soul is over there going, you need to pay attention to this. Hello. Hey. Yeah. And so you, you saw these books and how, how would other people see these types of messages that they're, they're going to go to shows or meet up with people that are a bit more spiritually minded and they're just giving them those triggers. That, yeah, a, a lot of times things show up that way. Okay. Yes. And the classic one is a book falls on your head in the bookstore. This did not happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably because at that point I kind of converted already to like the ebook. <laughs> it's hard to throw an ebook at your head. <laughs> um, but that's like a really classic one that I hear repeated often in the spiritual world is this book fell on my head in the bookstore and it was about, you know, fill in the blank, Akashic Records or reading angel cards or, or whatever the topic happened to be that was that person's doorway into this world. Um, and so these books kind of showed up and then they just, I kind of let them go because it it really didn't align with my rational way of thinking. And so when you ignore the whispers, <laughs> then your soul starts to take more aggressive means. And in my form, uh, I started to get very sick to the point that I was unable to hold down a job. And so I had a lot of time at home to like be thinking about things and trying to figure out what was going on with my illness since I'm a scientist. <laughs> I did a lot of like research on the internet and discovering, you know, what causes high cholesterol and some of the other symptoms I was seeing. Um, but I did not follow the breadcrumbs again uh, that had shown up for me around things like sound healing and and herbalists and this kind of stuff. I continued to like march past that because I'm on this path of conventional science will handle it <laughs> oh okay so first of all you've had this little bit of a whisper with books and um areas like that and because you didn't take enough action yes. you, <laughs> then the, the, this, this other physical realm starts to come in with your physical health Yes. And we're still focusing on, because I can see other people, I see so many of people do this, you know, it's like, okay, well, now I'm sick, so I've got to get that fixed. Yes, and, so and after I solve that problem, then I'll deal with this other stuff. Absolutely. But it turns yeah. out that the answer is actually, the thing you're putting off is actually part of the answer. Yes. And so I... I had all kinds of tests done to try and figure out what was going on with me. We discovered I have food allergies. We discovered uh, that my high cholesterol is because I'm an overproducer of cholesterol and my body will do that when there's something going on that it does not like. Um, we discovered that I did not have a metalloprotein problem. I, we discovered that I do have methylation deficiencies. We discovered that I don't have fibromyalgia. I don't have rheumatoid arthritis. I don't have lupus and some of these other things that what I had actually turned out to be. But I, I was doing the round from all the doctors to try and find my, my problem. 
the solution to my problem. And I finally sat with my intuition for a minute, which was telling me, you need a functional medicine doctor. Okay. And that was like my first moment of I'm really paying attention to my intuition. Yes. Yeah. And so I went looking for the zebra, which is a functional medicine doctor that's covered by my insurance. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) You're hitting the blend of both can be challenging. (laughs) Yes, exactly. But in the meantime, I've been chasing all this conventional stuff. And so my soul is like, you're not paying attention. And so not only was I unemployed, but my husband also lost his job. Okay. So money is not going to fix this. Oh, okay. Okay. So at this point, zero money coming into the household. Yeah. Okay. But there are things that we still need to accomplish. And amazingly, this is where the running at walls part of my story starts to arrive. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay running at walls now we talked a little bit about this a fair bit before we came on yes and um wait until you hear this explanation it is really really cool okay sorry i just had okay. to say that because i love this okay so what i call running at walls is your intuition tells you go this way and you look down the end of that path and all you can see is this brick wall okay but you listen to your intuition and you keep going that direction and your intuition starts pushing harder and harder. And so you start running towards this wall and you're like, oh man, I'm going to go splat, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you get close to that wall and all of a sudden one of two things happens. Either it turns out there was not a wall there at all. It was like an illusion. Or there's this solution that you couldn't have possibly seen from back there that suddenly shows up where you take a short turn into a path you had no idea was even there at the last minute. And so this is where my running at walls started. This is before I've even awakened, but I'm I'm leaning into the fact that I need to be listening to these small urges that are arriving. And so my husband and I are mutually unemployed. I'm very sick. And he says, I need to get another advanced degree in order to go into the area of expertise where I can remain employed because his industry had changed in a major sort of way. And so he sat with that for a few days trying to decide, do I need to get an MD? Do I need to get a Juris Doctor? Do I need to get an MBA? And he finally came back and said, I need to get an MBA. And this arrived at the same time that we mutually came to the conclusion we must declare bankruptcy. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. That must have been so hard after living in, in such a, a situation and then going through all this illness to start with and then having to declare bankruptcy. Gosh, that must yeah, be Yeah, it's hard. like you, you are oh. financially done. Everything that you've done up to this point, right, the saving, the investing, all of it, just kiss it goodbye it's because it's done. And wow. so, yeah, it was it was a hard spot to be in and not one I ever wanted to be in because personally I thought of it as committing bankruptcy. Okay, not oh. like this yeah, yeah. not this protected legal action that you take when you come to this realization that you can't meet yeah. your deaths. Uh, you know, I I had a lot of guilt that sat around that. So it was it, yes. really yeah. personally hard for me to go down that road. Uh, yeah. but I knew deep in myself that this had to happen. I also knew deep inside of myself that my husband needed to get his degree. And I knew that both of those things needed to happen now, but they seem to be mutually exclusive, right? Because the traditional way to get your degree is you take out student loans or you pay for it out of your salary and you go out and you get your degree. Hmm. And so I had no idea how this was supposed to happen, but we got him like in the application process for grad school. <laughs> and at the same time, I, I was directed to a bankruptcy attorney. And I was talking to the bankruptcy attorney about our situation. And he said, well, here's the deal. You do have this retirement money that you could dip into to at least start him on that road. But you can't just take it out and send a check to the to the college. We have to go yeah. through a, a certain process where it gets sent directly to the college in order for this to not trigger trustee situations. You know, he's the lawyer. I'm just trusting him. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> and so it was like, oh, okay. So there is a way for us to at least start him down this road. I still don't know how we're paying for the whole thing, but mm. the first trimester is figured out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so we kind of jumped over that hurdle. Then the next hurdle was you need to actually declare the the payment form of bankruptcy, not the we're totally bankrupt uh, because of the trustee. He, he knew the environment of the different trustees and how our money was structured. And so if we were to save any of our retirement money, it was important for us to go through the payer route. And so, okay, I don't know how this is happening because we're mutually unemployed. <laughs> There's a zero income coming in. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I know. And so I came home from that conversation and I said to my husband, you know, we need to get like $49,000 a year would be perfect because mm. it gives us the shortest bankruptcy we can have. Mm. And it gives us the most amount of money <laughs> to yeah, go yeah. as far as it can go. Right. And yeah. um, he had actually been invited by a friend of his to help him out at one of these professional conference things. His friend has a company. And uh, so he's like, sure, if you're paying for the travel and all that, I'm happy to come help you out. And it'll give me a chance to network, right? <laughs> so he went to this professional conference and came back from it and said, I had, do you remember this guy? I had lunch with him. And he has a personnel business that he'd like to expand into consulting. And so he's proposed a partnership and is offering me exactly $49,000 a year. <laughs> no, oh, that's gold. And I'm like, okay, so another brick wall passed through, right? <laughs> no way. You just, kept, you just kept on going. Just, until just, keep, just keep following it, right? Okay. Yeah, and yeah. so he started his program and he's starting with this partnership with this buddy of his. Yeah. And the other challenge is we're in Arizona. This opportunity is in Indiana. Okay. okay. This is this is not something he can commute on a daily basis or even like once a month. He's got yeah. to be there. Okay. We're in bankruptcy. We don't have money for him to live someplace. <laughs> okay? yes. yes. There's there's nothing spare for that. And so we had come from Indiana and I had this knowing that I needed to just let everyone know, which was something I didn't want to do. I, it felt very shameful to me that we were in this situation to start with. Yeah. Um, but I also knew I had to just be completely transparent. And so yeah. if I knew you in any capacity in Indiana, you got an email from me that said, hi, you might remember me from my time at the bank. Uh, we're in Arizona. We're in difficult straits right now. My husband has this opportunity for employment in Indiana, and we need a really inexpensive place for him to be. He's a real quiet, wonderful, unassuming man. All I need is a bed, a shelf in the refrigerator, a place to plug in the computer, and a place to park his car. You won't hardly notice he's there. He's a non-smoker. <laughs> yeah. And so I sent that out to Everyone, literally everyone I knew in Indiana. And I was in outside sales, so it was a long list of people. And of course, I got a lot of no's back, right? That's yeah. to be expected. And I got one yes. And what we ended up with was a former neighbor, her, his, her mother passed away, had this condo now that's in this retirement community. The bylaws say you cannot rent it out. Mm -hmm. You can only sell it to a buyer of a certain age. And the market was really bad in that moment. There, It was upside down. She couldn't get out of it what she needed to get out of it. And so she said, I need somebody who can keep an eye on this condo. And so if, if he's willing to keep the condo up and in good condition and pay the utilities, he can live there as long as he wants. Wow. So it, it zero dollars was the price, yeah. that, my price goal, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I got far more than I ever anticipated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so and another, are. another wall straight through, yeah. right? 
Well, but you ask. Um, one of the, the, the things I say about um, intuition or about anything like that, you've got to ask. You've got to yes. put it out there, whether you're doing it in prayer, whether you're doing it as in emails, whatever you do, you've got to ask because when you ask, you're open to receiving. Yes. And I had to swallow a whole lot of my pride and come to, to terms with a great deal yeah. of personal shame in order to step out and do this. And we had decided as a couple, we weren't going to try and hide this. We're just going to let it all hang out. If you knew us, you knew what was happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's how we found a place for him to be so he could accept this employment. Now, I can't go with him because we have to stay to keep a residence in Arizona in order to file bankruptcy in Arizona. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yep. Otherwise the rules change. And so he's off on his own and I have a clock that I'm running out because you have to be in the state for two years before you can be under the Arizona bankruptcy laws. And okay. we're not quite there yet. <laughs> so we're living in two places and he gets insurance through this employment, which is a beautiful thing because we didn't have health insurance prior to that. And the next wall that we're looking at, besides me being in another place to file this bankruptcy, is he's getting down to the end of that first trimester of grad school. Mm -hmm. And the question mark is, okay, how do we pay for the next one, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. And in keeping with our total transparency, one day when he was at lunch with his buddy that they're, they're starting this thing with, he mentioned that he was in the process of getting his MBA, you know, that finals were coming up and trying to figure out how he's paying for the next unit. <laughs> and his buddy is like, well, that's an amazing selling point for you to have your MBA. That'll benefit us a lot. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pay for it. <gasps> wow. Yeah, totally out of the blue. None, neither of us expected that. My husband was just sharing, you know, this is the challenge that we're sorting out. Wow. And so he's, his company picked it up. I'm like, yeah. well, damn. Okay. <laughs> Another wall passed right through. Wow. And that's because you just kept on following your, you kept on following your feelings, your gut, your intuition, your gut, you, you know, just that's what needs to be done. Exactly. Yeah. And so this brings me to this moment where I'm looking for this zebra, which is the functional medicine doctor yeah. that's under my insurance. Yes, yes. And so we had filed the bankruptcy by this point. And so I was free to move about the country if I had money to move about the country. And I was talking with my dad and I said, you know, it'd be really great if I could be with my husband, not just because I love being with my husband and it will help both of us, but also because the insurance that he has only covers doctors in Indiana and I'm in Arizona. Yeah. And my father went, well, what's it going to take to get you out there? And gave me the money to hire the truck and the movers and to get out there. Now I sold like a third of what we owned, maybe a little more than that. You know, I wasn't going to pay to move the piano, which was hard for me. That was a huge sacrifice because that was my childhood piano. That was the one that I asked for when I was five years old and it had been with me all my life. And mm. so sacrifices were made to make this happen. It wasn't all roses <laughs> yeah absolutely and it's always like that too yeah yeah and that, that makes you really go inwards and reflect and have a have a good look at what's important and what you need to take forward you didn't need to take that forward yeah. but the memories are hard to you yeah know, it is well and yeah. it sort of helped me because when I put it up for sale uh the lady who bought it bought it for her four-year-old daughter who was asking for a piano there you go so it's just recycled yeah yeah oh that's good that's good so it found a beautiful home <laughs> yeah 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 but it allowed me now to be on this search for the unicorn which i found mm. in indiana there was in fact one single functional medicine doctor who was covered under this insurance plan and so the instant i got out there i started with them and they were taking me through like the med the heavy metal overload tests and some of this other stuff. 
Um, we did the DNA sequencing that discovered the methylation defects. But even taking care of that stuff was not getting me better. I was actually getting worse. I was starting to not be able to tell you what had happened earlier in the day. I started not having my words when I wanted to share something. My husband would come home and say, well, what happened today? And I described the experience like you go out to the garage to get something. You open the door to the garage and the garage is gone. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, well, shit, let me go back in the house and you know, try something yeah, else. Okay. And so you close the door, you turn around and now the house is gone also. That's what my memory recall oh. was like at that yeah. time. It was really, really bad. I would go into the kitchen to make a 30 minute meal and three hours later, I would come out with perhaps a finished meal or maybe I would come out and defeat and go, we just need to order something. Wow. I mean, I was really dysfunctional and it was eating my brain. So what, what was actually the, the issue that you had? Like, you Well, had a what we eventually found out after we'd eliminated a lot of these other things, he says, I really think we should test you for Lyme disease. Oh, okay. Yes. And so he tested me for Lyme disease. He did the traditional test, the one that the FDA has approved. And then there are a couple of alternative tests you can do as well, because there's a problem with the official one. And the problem with the official one is it's sufficiently accurate that if you get a positive, it does mean you have Lyme, but it's mm. not sufficiently sensitive that getting a negative means you don't. Getting a yeah. negative just means they can't tell for sure. Yes, yes. And a lot of people don't realize that they get they take the test and they're going, well, oh, it didn't come back as Lyme. Well, it's that doesn't negative. mean it's not Lyme. Exactly. <laughs> then you get those false negatives, don't you? Yeah. yeah and, and this one is is rather notorious for the false negatives. Mm. And so that's why he did additional tests. And it was the additional tests that came back that said, yes, you have Lyme. You have Lyme that has created a biofilm that's protecting it. And this is a lot of what your body is probably reacting to with the high cholesterol. Oh. oh, and so now I know what it is. And so he comes to me with this plan. He's like, I have this protocol that I've developed and it's two years long and we do rotating antibiotics. And some of them are pretty exotic and have to be given through an IV. And then there are clearing IVs we give you because these buggers get really toxic when they die. And you're actually going to feel a lot worse before you feel better. <laughs> Oh, God. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I'm looking at this plan and going, I have no idea how much the insurance is going to cover of this, but it's going to add up in a hurry at $250 an IV. And so yeah. I, I went through the plan with my calculator and it came out, I had this range, it was going to be like 24 to $28,000 just for the first year. It's like, wow, okay, I'm in bankruptcy. <laughs> so the insurance is really going to pay uh, play a role here. So I called up the insurer and the insurance company said, we don't believe in chronic Lyme. Isn't that convenient? And we will only pay for 60 days of oral antibiotics, full stop. And by the way, your doctor is no longer in network. Oh. Yeah, that was my reaction well, to oh, so shit. many bloody oh, yeah. What, what the heck? You know how convenient. Yeah. We don't believe in the disease you have, so we're not going to cover it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, in Australia, they don't believe in Lyme. Yeah. You, you have to go to America to get any sort of um, answers Treat for it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. A answers or treatment. I I believe yeah. it, and it's it's really sad that we're in this space that there's mm. a whole section of the medical community that does not believe in this disease that's caused by an organism that they can pull out of your blood and look at and go, there it is. See, it's wiggling around. But it's not causing any problems. <laughs> no, it, it's not going to cause you any trouble at all. It's just a relative of syphilis and will eat your brain eventually. No problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're not worried about it. Yeah. No, mm, no, not at all. Oh, and so, gosh. you know, that was a real despairing moment for me. It's like, well, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, okay, if there's one moment to ask my parents for help, this has probably got to be it. Mm. And so I picked up the phone and I talked to my father again. And I said, here's the situation. We know what's been making me so sick. 
We know what's been making me dysfunctional. And, you know, the doctor has a plan. The insurance company is not going to pay for the first dime. Well, it'll pay for the first 60 days of oral antibiotics. But after that. <laughs> yeah, forget it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the bank of dad was empty. And the what was, sorry? The bank of dad was empty. Oh, okay. So yeah. there was there was nothing he was going to contribute to that. So yeah. that night I went to bed next to my husband in a really, I won't say despairing. I didn't start despairing. I started like frantically uh, seeking answers. My brain was kind of like this trapped squirrel and was bouncing off all the walls and going down all of the, the dead ends that I've already been down. Well, you can get a part-time job. No, I can't make a meal in 30 minutes. Well, maybe my husband, he's already working full-time and going to school full-time and taking care of me because I can't sufficiently take care of my own self. You know, well, maybe we can get a lot. We're in bankruptcy. I can't take out a loan from anything right now, mm. you know? And so I keep going around and going around and going around and there is not an answer. Yeah. And it was finally about three in the morning that I hit that moment of despair. It's like, I really have no idea. I, I think I know what the answer is. I can see the solution and I'm stretching my arm as far as I can stretch my arm. And it's still, you know, this much beyond the end of my fingertips. Yeah. And I finally just said, I don't have the answer. I'm between the rock and the hard place. And I can think of only one option at this point, And that was to pray. I had not prayed in decades, probably three at that point. And I kept it really short and simple. I just said, God, I will do anything to get better because I knew I was not done and I knew I couldn't live this way. Mm. And I got a response immediately. There was a little voice in the back of my mind that said, really anything. And that, so that sobers you up like really fast. <laughs> there, there are not a lot of edges on anything. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> yes, yes. Be, be careful what, what you're going to allow into your life. Yeah. And so I thought about it for a very long time. And I said, I'm talking to God. And as I understand God, God is not going to ask me to hurt anyone, cheat anyone, become an axe murderer or any of that kind of stuff, which is at my edges of anything, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so I replied, God, so that everyone was clear who I was talking to, <laughs> and who I'm promising anything to. Yes. Uh, I will do anything. Mm -hmm. And I got my first miracle because I fell asleep. I had not slept in it quite a few days at that point because my brain had deteriorated so much. I wasn't going through those normal sleep cycles that we usually do. And so yeah. that was a huge miracle in and of itself. And in the morning, I awoke with this clarity that I had to go get one of these clearing IVs from the doctor that's no longer in network. <laughs> And so that's what I did. And as I was sitting in the infusion room, he actually walks in, which the doctor doesn't come in the infusion room. I mean, he leaves that to the nurses. And so I waved him over and explained that insurance is out of the picture. They're not paying for squat. He's now out of network. We're in bankruptcy. I am now officially a cash pay client. You know, what options do you have for a cash pay client who's in my circumstance? And he says, well, since insurance is out of the picture, we do have a doctor on staff who's a naturopath and he works with herbs and he's got really good success with parasitic things and Lyme is a parasitic thing. And so I said, okay, well, I'll go see him. He's half the price for an office visit that this guy is. The herbs are 30 or $40 a bottle. We can probably figure that out better than, you know, $250 a shot IVs, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so I 
I just followed that road. It was a path that opened up. And so let's, let's follow that path. And when I made the appointment for the Natura path, I sat in his waiting room for quite a while. He was running behind or something. And so I was looking around for something to keep myself occupied with. And it turned out there was a book sitting on one of the side tables and a got my attention because usually it's crappy magazines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very true. Yes. <laughs> and so I grabbed up the book and the cover of the book says the emotion code. Now, I don't remember if I mentioned I was raised by a Norwegian and a German. And yeah. so what I was taught is emotions are bad and unacceptable unless you're happy. And anything that's sad, angry, uncomfortable, you need to shove that shit down and pretend like it's not happening. It's so you can press on it. regardless. Yes. yes. This, yes, this is what I was taught about emotions. Yeah. And only I, only the good ones count. Only, the, ones only the happy ones. And even those, you need to kind of moderate those. You don't want to yeah. be too happy, excited, or proud because that would be, you know, oh, unacceptable proud, yes. also. Yes. No, no. <laughs> and so that that was my experience with emotions and i'd spent a couple of decades in talk therapy trying to you know work out some of the crap from my childhood and hadn't had a lot of success with that so when i looked and saw that emotion code i'm like if this guy knows i want to know and so i'm i'm starting to read this book and i'd gotten a chapter or so into it and the owner came back from the for the book. And so I'm like, oh, crap, I got to find a way to get hold of this book now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I did manage to get a hold of the emotion code. That's the beautiful thing about the library card in America. You can go get anything for free if you really need it. Yes. And so I got a hold of the book and I started working my way through it. Mm. And he talks about heart walls in that book. I had a feeling I probably had trapped emotions because you know, shit would happen and it pops out as, as fresh as it was the day that it happened, right? Mm. Um, and so I learned how to release the trapped emotions. And then he talks about the heart wall, which I knew for a fact I also had because I've seen it. <laughs> I know that it's there and I make conscious choice whether I let you behind my heart wall or not, okay? So I knew for a fact that sucker was there. And so he has this process where you start taking it down. I thought everybody had one, that this was like normal standard equipment. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> it was a self-defense mechanism I had put up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all your protection, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I started taking that down and doing it in a really deliberate manner because you can only take down so much at a time. Yeah. And so every day I would come back and take down as much as my body would allow me. And then I would come back and I would take down some more. And as I was going through this process, weird shit started happening. <laughs> There's no other explanation for it. I was seeing passed over people. I was seeing angels and fairies. I was knowing things about the past and knowing things about the future that I had no way to know, but I also had no way to confirm. And so yes. the scientist in me is writing this shit off. It's like, you've got more brain damage than you realize. <laughs> you've got a really creative imagination, you know, this sort of thing. And then even stranger stuff started happening. I had this moment in the shower after I'd seen an angel where I, I spoke a prayer in Hebrew. Oh, now I was raised in Minnesota. There is not a large Jewish community. I think there's like maybe 10 guys so they can have one temple. Okay. <laughs> it's in all of Minnesota. Yeah. And so it's not like I was exposed to this as a child, but this prayer came out fully formed. And as far as I can tell, completely accurate because I, I looked up the first few words of it, which is how I discovered what it was. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, that's really wild. But I have no way to explain that. But it wasn't enough to convince the scientific side of myself to yes, em yes. fully embrace what's happening yet. Yes. It was just, oh, okay, something's happened. It's a little bit weird, but we're not going to go any, any further than that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is, I, I don't have an answer for that. But, you know, anomalous data, we'll just set that over there. <laughs> Sometimes you get that in data sets, right? <laughs> yes, you do. You do. Yeah. Strange random result. And yeah. so it 
your soul will continue to try and get your attention. And so I came home one day from the grocery store, which by the way, had become a really difficult experience because as I'm opening up all of my senses, I've become really sensitive to the emotions and the physical feelings of people around me. Now, I didn't understand that was happening, but what I knew in the moment was it got really hard to walk into the grocery store or Walmart because it felt like you were walking into a rock concert at full volume. There was like this physical hit of energy that would arrive into my system as I went through the door. And it's, I don't know what's going on here, but this is really unpleasant. Uncomfortable, right? isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Seriously, seriously uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't understand what it was in that moment or what was going on. I just knew it was happening. Yeah. And yeah. I knew that like, I would go home and my back would hurt like a son of a gun right under my rib cage next to my spine. I'm like, what have I done to my day? I throw up my back, what's going on, right? But I, I haven't had time to pursue that because I'm busy healing and taking, <laughs> clearing all these emotions and taking down my heart well. And yeah. so I came back from the grocery store and my neighbor is helping her husband into the house and he's doubled over in what's visibly a shit ton of pain. Mm. And so they're in their mid 80s. I'm not going to leave her staggering under his weight screw the ice cream. And I go over and, and help her get him in the house. And she's telling me, oh, his kidney situation has gotten so bad. The pain is so terrible. We need to try and get him an emergency doctor's appointment. And so she goes off to call the doctor and I'm in the living room trying to provide comfort to her husband. And there's not much to be had. I mean, he, he hurts whether he stands or he sits or whatever. So we chose to just stand in the living room and I'm holding his hands and he closes his eyes and I can see his lips are moving. Now it's only been a couple of weeks since I prayed last. <laughs> and that was a few decades from the time before that. So I'm not very comfortable just voyeuristically watching him talk to his God. Yes. Uh, so I closed my eyes to give him some privacy. And when I closed my eyes, in my mind's eye, I saw this little flame and it looked just like a pilot light that's on the edge of going out. It kind of dances and pops and flickers right before it goes. Yep. And I'm given this understanding in my mind that that's where his life force is right now. This is a representation of where he is and he is on the edge of poof, out of mm -hmm. here. And I haven't acknowledged who I'm talking to or even what I might be inviting in in this moment. I simply asked, is there something we can do about that? I don't know why I asked, I just did. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask it out loud, I just asked it in my mind. And the moment I asked, this flame turned into this like great big roaring bonfire. And at the same moment, he drops my hands. And so, of course, my eyes whip open. <laughs> like, Why do you drop my hands? And he looks at me and says, are you a healer? And I'm kind of looking around to see who he's talking to because this has not entered my perception in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I was saved from having to even address that question because his wife came in and said, we've got an appointment. We have to leave right now. Okay, great. So we hustle him out to the car and I'm greatly relieved because I don't have to address any of that. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've escaped without having to give any answers. And I hid in my house for a couple of days until I guilted myself out. You're a crappy neighbor. You haven't gone to check. I mean, he could be in the ICU. Who knows if she's planning a funeral and you haven't even brought over chicken soup. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the rational side of me at this point has convinced me that there was nothing to that little event that happened there. It, it was nothing. And you need to be prepared that she's maybe burying her husband. And so I went next door and I kind of hesitantly tapped on the door. She opens it and she's got a big smile on her face. I'm like, okay, so he's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> And she said, oh, I'm so happy to see you. Come on in. Jay has so many questions. And that's when I went, uh-oh, because I, I've got zero answers. I've convinced myself that nothing has happened. I step into the living room and there he is. He's kicked back in his Barca lounger. He's got his remote and his book and he's looking fat and happy in his chair. 
I'm like, wow. uh, how you doing, Jay? And he says to me, it was the strangest thing. By the time we got to the doctor's office, I was feeling pretty good again. And they ran me through all the usual battery of tests. And my kidney function was normal. I haven't had normal kidney function in decades. And if you know anything about conventional wisdom in medicine, kidneys don't heal. The only direction you go with kidney function is downhill. Down, yeah, yeah. And this guy's kidney function returned from crap to normal. Whoa. In the length of a drive to his doctor's office. And so the scientist in me had to sit down and shut the fuck up. <laughs> and accept that this is part of the anything I signed on for, not just what happened with him, but the prayer in a language I had no way to know, the things that I've been seeing about people's pasts and futures and the angels and past crossed over people I've been interacting. This is all part of the anything I signed on for. Wow. Um, I'm just, this story is just amazing. But, Sophia, we are getting low on time. I bet we are. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've gone through and you've got all this understanding and this health and, you, you, you've, like I said, you've actually asked for help and said, you know, what I, whatever I need to do. And then you've got all these other signs that have come through and this beautiful healing and everything else. Um was that was that the final step over where you went, okay, there's more to life than what I was looking at? And yeah, th this is where I surrendered into, you know, when I said anything, this is the anything. And so yes. it it behooves me to not just unwillingly be dragged by, down this road, which is what was happening up to this point, yes. but to actually lean into it and yes. to learn more. And yes. what... When you lean into it, the universe, your God squad, whatever you want to call your support system, it will provide you with what you need, need in that yeah. moment. And so the naturopath that I was seeing actually had a son who was a medical intuitive. He was one of the first people I actually talked to about what was going on mm. and what was happening with me. And he started to explain, well, you're a physical empath. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> this thing that's happening at the grocery store, it's a yes. part of the gift. Um, and so between him and the books that I was able to get a hold of through the library system, like Rose Rose Trees, Empath Empowerment Series, um, Healing Hands by Barbara Brennan, and some of these sorts of books, uh, started to give me an understanding of what, how does this woo world work? What are these gifts about? How do I, how do I live in this world with this heightened sensitivity without being completely overwhelmed and having to like completely closet myself away from other people? Yeah. I mean, I'm an introvert, so I mean, that's not completely <laughs> distasteful to me, but my husband is not. Okay. And so yeah. we like to be able to socialize and have people at the house and go places. And so I needed to learn how to be able to be in both worlds to mm -hmm. still have that sensitivity, but not be overwhelmed by it. And so these were all useful tools, the, the, things that I learned in the books. I had many, many masters who you would be very hard pressed to get a hold of in any way other than a book. Yes. Um, but it was an absolutely wonderful, beautiful process to step into. But it was that that moment of impossible healing that yeah. really drew me through that door. I won't say pushed me because it's a free will choice. I could have continued to be stubborn. Yes. <laughs> And get more signs. <laughs> and and could get more signs and things yeah. could continue to get more intense or I yeah. could choose to step through. And so I chose to step through. So I've got to, I've got to close it off, but what is one um, uh, hint, idea, advice that you would give somebody that is looking at, that they've, they've experienced all of these signs and, and um symptoms for want of another word and what would be the best way to just step forward for them your soul will tell you what the best way to step forward is so pay attention to what gets put in your path who gets thrown into your path 
uh, and explore it with openness and curiosity, one of the biggest things I had to learn to do was A, to accept it was going to be hugely uncomfortable to become fundamentally different than I was, um, but it was on the flip side going to be hugely rewarding to go through that process. It it felt a lot, I think, like the butterfly probably feels when it goes through its metamorphosis, right? Because here mm. you are, I'm, I'm this little caterpillar, right? Crawling around and I'm eating my leaves and whatever. And then all of a sudden I've, I've stuffed myself full of food and I'm hanging upside down and then I barf all over myself <laughs> to create this chrysalis where I then get melted down and put together back into this strange new form. Mm. And you know, you come out of it and you're like, I don't recognize myself. Yeah. And you know what? It's okay because you've just become an amazing, beautiful creature that you are destined to be. And all of the pain is worth it every moment. And all of the confusion is a beautiful part of the process when you start to look back on it. Oh. Because you see the pattern in hindsight. Yeah. When you're going through it, it's like, this seems so strange and disembodied. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you can reflect back, yeah, it makes yeah. a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, thank you so, so much release the confusion done. and, and yep. step into it. Yeah. Step into it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being on the show. I, I do thank want you. to say that um, all your details will be down in the descriptions. So we'll have the links and everything else if you want to link um, with Sophia. And you do have a podcast too. So Yes, and you're we'll on my them. podcast actually. Yes, <laughs> I'll, I'll put all that in down in the description because we are running out of time. Um, so thank you for being on the show. And, yes, thank you um, for having me. Yeah, oh, I better get my branding stuff right. Um, okay, I will just go solo layer oh, pressing all the buttons that was amazing I, and, it, and look it's really funny there's times that we want to jump in and ask questions but the way Sophia was explaining it and and I just wanted to listen it was such an enjoyable way of getting that understanding of going uh, learning about all those little signs and symptoms that are making you that soul awareness that is making you want to change and go forward so that is beautiful Remember to connect with her. The all the details are down in the description, and you'll be able to see where her podcast is and all the rest of it. But I have to go because we're running out of time. So I'm going to say bye for now, and I'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>